On the 4th of March 2018, Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were found unconscious on a park bench in Salisbury, Wiltshire. The former British double agent and his daughter had been poisoned with the Novichok chemical nerve agent. They were lucky to survive. Since then, a series of thrilling spy stories have filled the headlines, from the further Novichok poisoning of Alexei Navalny, to cyber attacks on Iranian nuclear facilities, and the peddling of disinformation by hostile foreign governments. These new stories appear to give us a glimpse into the world of today's spies. But how much can we really know about what intelligence agents are up to? How has espionage changed in the 21st century? And are spies really anything at all like James Bond? Let's look at the history behind the headlines. My name is Jill Bennett. I'm an, a historian who specialises in secret intelligence. The first thing we need to understand is what the word spy actually means. It's a rather vague umbrella term. But of course, in the end, espionage is to do with secret intelligence, which means acquiring information that other people don't want you to have. So we talk about intelligence officers, and they are the people who work for intelligence agencies. If those intelligence officers recruit agents, they're the people who get the information for them. So really, officers and agents is what you might call the correct terminology. Now we've got the basics down, let's go back in time to the golden age of spying, the Cold War. This is a photograph from a seemingly normal garden party at Cranley Drive in Ryslip in the 1950s. Standing next to Frank and Nora Dole is a man known as Peter Kroger. His wife, known as Helen, is behind the camera. Despite their seemingly normal lifestyle, both were Russian spies. Along with three others, they formed the Portland Spy Ring, who passed secrets from a Royal Navy research facility back to the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. To tell us more about the Portland Spy Ring, here's Simon Ennis Robbins, part of the Cold War team at Imperial War Museums. The Portland Spy Ring was based uh, in Portland, Dorset, which is where the Admiralty had a research uh, centre. HMS uh, Dreadnought was, was the first British nuclear sub and a lot of their technology and the high secret materials was going through Portland. And this is what the Russians were after. And they had been able to get two spies, uh, Harry Horton and his girlfriend, Ethel. She was actually had a lot of um, top secret material that was passed in through her hands. How it worked was that Harry went up to um, London and met Gordon Lonsdale and handed over the lots of incriminating doc, top secret documents to him. He then microfilmed them and took them over to the Krogers who were living in Ryslip. And then they were in contact with Moscow by radio. They, that's how they were then passed on to the Russians. A classic example of Soviet um, operations to try and get hold of Western technical intelligence at the time. Even though the technology in this case is fairly primitive, you can see it now, there's nothing that different of the Portland Spy case to other cases um, ever since, before and, and after. If we go back to that photograph, the Krogers, or so they called themselves, are what are called illegals, people living their cover in another country under an assumed identity. The chosen cover for the Krogers was a rather strange one. And they set themselves up as antiquarian booksellers. And they bought this house in Ryslip. And it was a place where they used to entertain quite regularly. And it was only through an accident, really, and through a defection of a Polish spy, that the um, MI5 were actually managed to get onto them. Frank and Nora, um, who are the neighbours, their house was actually used by A4 who the surveillance team of MI5 who were keeping tabs on, on the Krogers. They were able to keep a non-stop surveillance. It was there that they were able to make the link between them and the Portland spy ring. But hang on a minute, if the Portland spy ring is our sort of classic espionage operation, then how do we understand the poisonings and cyber attacks that have made headlines recently? I wouldn't. I wouldn't class that as espionage. Bumping somebody off because you regard them as having betrayed you in the past, it is a crime, yes, but it is not 
espionage in any way that we really recognize because intelligence agencies have by the nature of their work to be secret much of what they do you would not hear about it only the most exceptional examples of espionage rise up to the surface of public knowledge so the stories that make it to the headlines are actually the exceptions rather than the rule so how did the public react then when they found out about the portland spy ring it was a very embarrassing case because initially the wife of Harry Horton had some time before approached the Admiralty and said that she thought her husband was um, undertaking espionage activities and nobody took any notice of her. They thought she was uh, a disaffected wife doing it out of spite. One thing that's really important to remember here is that at this time, none of the UK's intelligence agencies were avowed. That means, you know, they weren't mentioned in, in the newspapers or anywhere else. Whatever emerged was just the kind of very top level of the story. In the vacuum left by real life spy stories, the public turned to fiction instead. So how accurate are characters like James Bond when compared to the officers and agents that really exist? Well, of course, James Bond is a, is, is a fictional character. He doesn't really ever collect much intelligence and he doesn't really recruit agents. And people who work with him for a while are liable to find themselves dead. IWM actually has the Browning High Power, that's James Bond's pistol, in our collection. And in fairness, this is a weapon used by British operatives in places like Northern Ireland. But stepping back for a moment, do officers and agents even carry firearms? Or would they have a licence to kill? No. <laughs> Assassination very much not part of the day job of <laughs> the intelligence officer. I mean, obviously, espionage is by definition a hazardous world, but it is not. I mean, you know, those things are dramatised because that makes them exciting to read about and to watch. If you think about the Krogers, I mean, it's actually more exciting than a lot of public depictions of being. In the 1940s, Nora Cohen, to use her real name, passed information from inside the US atomic project back to the Soviet Union. The Cohens even had to flee the US after their friends and fellow agents, the Rosenbergs, were executed. They were long-term professional intelligence operatives. So, you know, within their story, there's a huge amount of drama um, in a way that surpasses a lot of the, the spy stories one can read. Bearing all that in mind then, how different are the officers and agents of yesterday to the ones active today? Really, over the past century, espionage has changed far less than you might think. The spreading of disinformation, for example, or indeed um, cyber hacks. Obviously, they have transformed the way of collecting intelligence. The fact remains that you still have to have people collecting it. You have to have people analysing it. That the whole point of espionage, whether it is technological or human, is to acquire secretly, covertly information that the other people don't want you to have. I'm afraid those are all the secrets we're going to spill today. Thank you so much to Jill for her expertise and to Simon for taking us through those objects. This is the first in a new series from the IWM Institute called History Behind the Headlines. So please do let us know what you thought of it in the comments below. We'd love to know what you think. Finally, of course, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode and I'll see you then.